Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Alt Space VR and to the very first AWE Night SF event uh, for 2021. Uh, uh, I'm Patrick Johnson, co organizer of AWE Night SF and CEO of Rock Paper Reality. I'll be your host for today's event, all about looking ahead at AR in 2021. Uh, this is always one of my favorite events of the year, and today you're all in for a real treat. But before we get started, uh, does everyone know where their emojis are? All right. So um, you can find them on your menu. Nice. Uh, uh, show emojis. How many of you have been to an alt space event before? All right. That's pretty good. Like 50%. How about a uh, AWE? AWE event? Okay, cool. Uh, and then how many of you are in VR right now? Nice. Anybody not in VR? <laughs> Sweet. All right. So, awesome. Well, um, thanks everybody for coming out. And um, yeah, so for those who don't know, AWE Night SF is part of the Greater Augmented World Expo family and is the world's number one spatial computing event series with conferences and expos including US, Europe, and Asia, and supports 16 independently run AWE Nights around the world. Uh, you can join the conversation on all the social channels using hashtag AWE Night SF. So please post about the event. We've been eatering near 5,000 members for a few months, and we really want to hit that milestone, but we need your help. So spread the good word, and we'll also be recording tonight's event so you can relive the awesomeness and be sure to share it with your friends. Um, all righty, and now for just a few final bits of housekeeping, all audience members will remain muted throughout the event. And if we have time for Q&A at the end, feel free to use your raise hand feature and we will try and call on you. After the Q&A, there will be plenty of time for XR mingling. Um, all right, you ready to kick it, the show off? Great, so uh, we have a fantastic lineup for you tonight, starting with Mike Boland, Chief Analyst at Artillery Intelligence to give you a rundown of the industry predictions and then we'll have a fireside <laughs> chat between Tom Emmerich, uh, VP of product at 8th Wall, and Amy LaMare, partner at the WXR Fund. Um, so let's go ahead and welcome uh, Mike. To Everyone. It's awesome to be here. Um, so first of all, um, for those of you who have joined us in the past may recognize this space, but you also may recognize that we've sort of dressed it up a little bit with some new accoutrement, um, signs and screens and such. Uh, so this represents the next stage in our evolution. And for that, we really want to thank Wen Chang, who's done a great job at kind of dressing up this space. And if you continue to join us at future events, we're going to continue to do that and even find some some new kind of fun, fun venues beyond this sort of uh, of movie theater stage-like uh, environment. Um, so um, I'm going to give some uh, slides. When, how are we doing on those slides? Thank you. So you can uh, you can advance those as I go. Perfect. Um, so um, before really um, kind of going into our our main event here, which is going to be uh, Tom Emmerich and Amy LaMare, um, I hope to sort of set the stage um, for the next 10 minutes or so and sort of a lightning round look at Artillery's 2021 predictions from a recent report um, that we did. So before getting into it, a quick about, bit about me for context. I'm a 15-year tech industry analyst, and I run Artillery Intelligence, which is a market research and analyst firm for spatial computing. Um, and that takes form in lots of narrative reports and data deliverables and market forecasts and consumer surveys, um, and we have a sister publication called AR Insider, which uh, you may know about. Um, 
So one of the things on that list of deliverables, um, the reason I kind of mentioned that is, is these monthly reports we do. So we have a big white paper every month. Um, and when you can go to the next slide here, um, and once per year, we focus on the lessons from the last 12 months and the outlook for the next 12 months. So that's where we're sort of drawing upon today. Um, and I've streamlined it into the top five trends uh, in the interest of time. So let's get right into it. Um, when you can go to the next slide for prediction one. Um, so the first trend gets into the question that's sort of on everyone's mind, which is AR glasses, and particularly what Apple could end up doing. Um, and as many signals indicate, we won't see Apple AR glasses in 2021, but we will see the ball moved forward from other companies like Vuzix, which just un unveiled its micro LED smart glasses at CES. And I actually bring the, up those glasses specifically and deliberately because I think it represents a design target we're really going to start to see more of so instead of bulky headgear that provides graphically intensive ar experiences like magic leap the pendulum will start to swing towards social wearability is what i call it as really the the primary design target and of course that has ux trade-offs but I think it's still a necessary starting point for mainstream acclimation for glasses that people will actually wear. Um, and that brings us back to Apple because several signs point to the fact that it will take this sort of wearability route for its V1 glasses, which could come in the 2022 or 2023 timeframe. And, and Apple is the other thing, the other sort of clue is that it really needs to shoot for massive markets due to its size and fiduciary drive. And and the concept of smart sunglasses or corrective eyewear even that also have some digital features that play off of other wearables like AirPods and watch is a much larger potential market for Apple than bulky AR headgear. Now, that said, something bulky with more sort of graphical intensity could instead come in the nearer term VR device that was rumored last week in Bloomberg that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. And then, you know, with respect to AR, Apple's eventual goal, of course, is, you know, full on AR immersion. But we believe what's more likely in that V1 is what we're calling AR light. Now, if we go to the next slide to kind of pan back to put some numbers against all of that, um, we think that Apple could inflect the market with its class classic halo effect, and we project almost 4 million AR glasses sold in 2024 with Apple as the market share leader. But keep in mind, to put this into perspective, this looks like very steep growth, and it's growing from a base of almost zero today, but that 4 million units in 2024 is still dwarfed, or it will be dwarfed, by the smartphone install base uh, by about 1,000 to 1. So it still has miles to go. So if we go to the next prediction, prediction two, um, speaking of smartphones, uh, that's certainly the dominant AR delivery vehicle today, as we all know. Um, mobile AR piggybacks on smartphone scale, and though it's not AR's fully actualized version, it's a compelling step on its evolutionary path that's creating real value today, as we'll get into in the next prediction. But if we go to the next slide first, uh, to again sort of put some, some numbers behind some of these claims, uh, there are about 3.4 billion smartphones globally most of which are actually compatible with web AR, given the great work of companies like Eighth Wall. Um, and, and that's followed by AR compatibility for Facebook, which includes Instagram and Messenger, then ARKit, ARCore, and Snapchat. But the more important figure is not AR compatibility, but actual AR users. So by adding up and deduping all of these platforms, we get an aggregate mobile AR user base of about 600 million growing to more than 800 million by the end of this year. Now, a few highlights here before we move on are that Snapchat actually doesn't have the biggest device reach, but it has the largest portion of its users that are AR active um, at about 75%. And I think that holds lots of kind of lessons in the the kind of um, the UX and, and the AR culture, the camera culture that Snapchat's been able to build. Uh, for a lot of the same reasons, Instagram is a sleeping giant as it continues to integrate AR as is TikTok, which has really barely scratched the surface. If you think about it, TikTok is today where Snapchat was a few years ago before it scaled up Lens Creation by launching Lens Studio. So if TikTok is able to make a similar platform play, it could really be you know, formidable in AR. 
So if we go to the next uh, slide, uh, this is the third prediction. Um, this stems from the mobile AR opportunity that we just went over, but you know where some revenue is being created. And the, the largest revenue category today is AR advertising. And that's really grown as a function of the high engagement being established by Snap and others to enhance social sharing. So advertisers have naturally followed those eyeballs and are seeing big results. Um, and, and AR not only speaks to their creative sensibilities in terms of you know, more dimension to show off products, but they're also seeing real results and a business case for campaign performance. And that includes the KPIs that they often look for, such as engagement depth, dwell time, and even direct conversion boosts in, in the, um, the um, in e-commerce context, excuse me. Um, and, and we have several case studies that flesh these results out, a lot of these campaign results uh, on AR Insider. Now, to quantify all that, if we go to the next uh, slide, um, we project mobile AR advertising to grow from 1.4 billion last year to more than 8 billion by 2024. But to address the elephant in the room here, economic downturns tend to hit advertising budgets hardest. But the exception is with emerging ad mediums, which tend to actually benefit from downturns. And that's simply because those economic shifts cause advertisers to re-examine their ad mix and shift ad budgets to more performant media. So it essentially accelerates that digital transformation that's already underway. And that's exactly what we saw in the last two big downturns, which accelerated the shift to search in the early 2000s and social in the kind of early 2010s. And we believe AR will really continue to grow and get discovered for these sort of cyclical reasons, in addition to a broader secular shift. So, um, if we um, go to the next slide, please, um, and moving on to the, the fourth prediction, um, you know, everything I've mentioned so far is, is really in sort of a consumer context, but what about enterprise? So it's actually been one of AR's bright spots along with advertising. And, and that boils down to the lack of stylistic requirements that we see in consumer markets and, and the tangible business case and ROI gains from productivity boosts with line of sight AR guidance in industrial settings. But it's not all good news. Um, one realization of the past few years is that though these factors make adoption a sort of no brainer at, at the C-suite level, actual successful implementation and buy-in throughout large organizations is a fully different story. So there continue to be challenges and also sort of best practices developing for things like internal communications and change management, which is really where the battle for enterprise AR will be fought, not necessarily with the technology itself. So if we go to the next slide, um, due to those challenges, we think Enterprise AR's tipping point will be delayed. It sort of keeps pushing back and it won't happen in 2021, but we're confident that it will come eventually as the, the momentum for Enterprise AR and some of those, you know, clear cut ROI business cases um, sort of overpower all that inertia, but it will be a gradual climb. So speaking of gradual climb, uh, if we go to the next slide with the kind of fifth and final prediction, what about VR? So it's it's certainly gotten a lot of um, flack for being a disappointment over the past few years in kind of broader tech markets. But the thing is, I keep reminding people, VR is doing just fine and, and it's growing as an industry at healthy levels. It's just sort of unfortunate that it was so hyped as a world-changing technology, which hasn't happened to the kind of levels that, that you know, it was hyped up to do or to be. Um, so if we go to the next slide uh, to kind of quantify where we are with VR, uh, 2020 certainly saw some challenges and unit shipments declined about 10% year over year. And that's due mostly to both COVID infected supply chain impediments, but also a decline in consumer spending. Uh, but the key point is it could have been worse if not for a few factors. So most notably, Oculus Quest 2's October launch created a strong Q4 surge for VR, and Facebook really beefed up its supply chain after learning from Quest 1 that it underestimated demand in Q4 2019 and didn't want to make that mistake again. So over the past few months, it's actually done a 
pretty good job keeping pace with demand. And we think that'll continue into 2021, especially given Quest 2's quality to price ratio, which is very strong. Um, and it also helps that Facebook is making long-term investments in building a network effect rather than prioritizing near-term hardware margins. So I like to say, it's trading margins for market share. Um, but the practical result of all of that for consumers is that they're getting hardware that's much cheaper than it should be. Um, and that's gonna continue to drive sales. So the bottom line is that we see aggregate sales of console, PC, and standalone VR hardware growing to just over 6 million units this year by the end of 2021 and 14 million by 2024. And during that time, Quest and, and all its future variants, you know, three, four, you know, however many uh, kind of Quest variants we see in this kind of five year period w will certainly take over as the market share leader for all the reasons I just mentioned. So uh, that's it for me. I hope this has been helpful in sort of, you know, setting the setting the setting the stage um, and, and providing some framework for a all the stuff happening across the spatial spectrum. And, you know, there's a lot more where that came from. And you can contact me using the info on this slide um, when you can go to the contact slide there to kind of transition out. Um, and hopefully um, this, you know, set the stage well for Tom and Amy to go over Tom's much longer and more insightful list of AR projections. Um, so at this point, I'll uh, uh, kind of get out of the way and uh, welcome Tom and Amy to the stage. All you guys. Hey there, everybody. Um, can everybody hear me okay? You're sounding Thank good, you Amy. For the Thanks for the claps. Uh, Hopefully Tom will be up in a second and thank you very much Mike for um, your insights. They're always super useful. Um, as a managing partner of WXR Fund, we use your data a lot in conversations that we have with partners and with um, investors and uh, so really appreciate all the insight that you do over the course of the year, both looking back and looking forward. Um, so maybe uh, while Tom's coming up here, I'll just uh, say a few words about who I am for those of you that don't know me. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm the one of the two managing partners of WXR Fund. We invest in VR, AR, and AI uh, startup, usually at the seed stage and, and Series A, um, with female founders. So we have uh, six companies in our portfolio right now, and we go across all industries um, focusing on uh, US-based companies. I seem to be quite a bit taller than you. Let me see if I can fix that. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Well, it might just be this Tom, way. if you move up up towards the, the edge of the stage, you will naturally kind of pop up. There you go. There we go. Oh, great. Sorry about that, Amy. Oh, I got kicked oh, out. I'm, I'm yeah, back. Yeah. We're ready to ready to talk. <laughs> there we go. How's that? I'm a little lower. No. That's great. Well. Um anyway, I was just saying who I was and um and what type of companies we invest in. Great. Hi, everybody. My name is Tom Emmerich. I'm the VP of product at 8th Wall. I've been in augmented reality now for over a decade. Um, I've worn a couple of hats, um, both on the product side, uh, as well as uh, from a community building um, aspect, a journalist, uh, VC. Um, and I'm back on the product side, very happy to be um, helping uh, to build uh, uh, the spatial web at 8th Wall. Um, and I'm really eager to sit down and talk with Amy. Um, we talk on a regular basis, and so this feels right at home <laughs> in a way, except with a lot more people obviously listening into the conversation. And so this conversation here um, is really going to first take a look back at 2020, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, you know, what we thought were the big takeaways from last year before we start um, you know, surmising and discussing what we're looking forward to uh, coming up this year. And I think Mike set a really great foundation with what he does best with all the numbers uh, to put things into context. So Amy, let's, uh, let's get started and talk about 2020. What for you were mm -hmm. some of the big takeaways or aha moments from last year? 
Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I think Mike really nailed them. The one thing that I would add is I think that there was a growth in virtual events, right? With the uh, most of us being stuck at home and and using a lot of Zoom and a lot of video and mm-hmm. and being comfortable with the virtual, right? Um, I think there are more people interested in exploring what is that next layer other than just a two dimensional flat screen and how can we connect in a way that has perhaps a little bit more presence, right? And so I think we're seeing more exploration into the the virtual events like like these, um, mm-hmm. and particularly with the Quest 2 and the, the ability to, you know, have with more folks being able to access that from a cost perspective and access and, you know, acquire that over the past few months. So I think there's a rise in, in that space and seeing some interesting things like, you know, Burning Man that happened here in alt space back in August and still exists now and has continued events over the course of the year. And I, I think that's been a really interesting highlight for 2020. Mm. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think, you know, what was very clear to me is that with the pandemic forcing all of us to be at home and then looking for ways to be able to still connect with people, we turned to technology and technology Mm -hmm. started to become a necessity in so many ways to be able to do that. And like you pointed out, the rise of these virtual connections, virtual events, virtual meetings, um, it it, it made it clear outside of Silicon Valley when I was talking to my friends in Canada and and around the world that many of them were quite new to even Zoom or FaceTime. And so that gave me a pause uh, to think, wow, like in order for us to get to virtual reality and augmented reality, we still have a step in between to make sure that the, the world understands understands the value and just like virtual so virtual before virtual mm-hmm. reality became clear to me right. i think that's what you're talking about mm-hmm. um and so uh i think the pandemic really helped to uh accelerate the use of technology as a tool to help us feel like you said present in at a time where before the pandemic um arguably technology was at odds with us right and so we we often would hear that the smartphone is distracting us from being you know with each other and that story is now changed where technology is for the for some uh, the only tool that we have to be able to actually be connected and be present with one another today so that was like a really interesting kind of takeaway you know yeah i agree with you i agree with you yeah and then I thought also like just speaking about AR um, and I love where um, it was interesting because 2020 was supposed to be a huge year for so many things, but also uh, the rumors of AR glasses, consumer AR glasses um, uh, launching and becoming a hit, uh, a thing really were revolving around 2020 for some. And that makes sense in my uh, many blog posts, I kept joking that 2020 would be the perfect year because of 2020 vision. So it's kind of like a really the most the greatest pun ever that could have been materialized and substantialized with uh, AR glasses. But, you know, we as an industry saw so many, uh, you know, um, launch events, but yet no AR glasses. And so really kind of like level setting possibly how far out we are from, you know, AR glasses becoming consumer mainstream, but also seeing another year pass um, where AR glasses are not yet even announced, yet alone available, you know, to, mm-hmm. to everyday people. Um, what do you think about that? Or what were your thoughts as the year passed on, on yeah, AR glasses? I, yeah, I was definitely hoping for some more progress in that area, although the more research that I've done in that space and reading that I've done in terms of the technology and patents, I understand that um, it is super challenging technology. And so um, you know, the good news, I think, for our space and our industry is that you're seeing a lot of people interested and um, and continuing to work in that space, right? It's not like people are giving up and going home. It's that um, it's that it's just taking longer than we all expected, right? We had the Facebook announcement at um, Facebook Connect in the fall about, you know, their AR glasses as well. So, you know, you're still seeing the major technology players. And to be honest, I, you know, there are still startups out there working on them as well, or, mm-hmm. um, you know, other companies that are in their first, you know, version two or some being acquired, right? So th- there's certainly an interest in this space and a continuation of um, knowing that that will 
will be a thing, but just not in 20, it wasn't in 2020. Yeah, exactly. And I think the big message that we heard from across the board really was that AR glasses are hard. Like almost all players that have communicated in any way about AR glasses um, have indicated how hard they are and, and the, the major, as you pointed out, the major problems that need to be solved. Um, and before we start talking about 2021, you know, there were some great hardware um, uh, announcements and, and, and um, improvements for AR last year, but they were with the smartphone. And so the smartphone was always capable of augmented reality or has been capable for an, now a couple of years, especially since the introduction of a couple of platforms making use of the camera and sensors. But this smartphone just got like, it got leveled up. Now it's an even more powerful device with LiDAR and ultra wideband, you know, spatial audio opportunities. Um, exactly. And so that, that in itself is quite exciting, don't you think? I do, I do. I mean, the ability for the camera to understand depth is huge and is certainly a significant step towards, um, towards you know, three dimensions in general, right? Um, mm -hmm. Whether that be on a phone or whether that be through glasses. So, yeah, definitely exciting. And, and um, it's, it's been fun to scan my, my room. I don't know if you've <laughs> played with any of those. Yeah. <laughs> those. Yeah, yeah. And, and capture spaces and, um, and, and, and to see what other creators are, are building. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, I think like watching, especially Twitter and following the 3D um, uh, scanning companies and the 3D scanning artists that are out there filling up, you know, repositories like uh, Sketchfab has been really, really interesting. And maybe, uh, you know, some a sign of something to come, hopefully, from outside of the XR community. Um, and I guess, like, that's that's maybe a good segue to talk about 2021. In terms of hardware, like, what are you, what are you hoping for? What, where, do you, where do you see um, things evolve from a hardware perspective within this year? Yeah, I mean, uh, so we've talked about AR a little bit in, in smart classes and, and, you know, that's probably more of a 2022 thing, even though I think Facebook said 2021 for theirs. But, um, but, but just even the, uh, the ability for phones to continue to increase their processing speeds, the, the 5G um, the, the more that we can have 5G abilities, right? All of that will help the basis of spatial computing in general to be easier to use and more ubiquitous, right? I mean, again, there's that concept. 4G, when we were at 3G, we couldn't even watch more that we can, can uh, level up on the processing speeds and, and bandwidth, the, the more content and interactivity we'll be able to have. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I think, yeah, that I makes think a that, lot of sense. I think that, there's that like that's supporting, a... supporting infrastructure that isn't necessarily very exciting, but so key for, <laughs> for usability, right? Right, right. But I think that's like something to like very much underscore, like that jump in network is going is you know it, it's been that promise since 5g has um, begun to be part of a conversation but we're de definitely starting to see 5g really become a real player within this space and how that's going to impact and unlock ar and vr is like an order of magnitude um of, of benefit and so as you mentioned like every time every time the camera gets better the screen gets better the, the chip and the, the processor gets better um you know um uh, the network the gets better Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what are you amazing. seeing on the on the webinar side, and what are you looking forward to on, on, on in that space? Well, um, in just like social AR and native app AR benefit from better smartphones, web AR also benefits from the same. And so um, definitely seeing um, uh, an improvement in mobile is a great thing for web AR. I think one of the things I'm really excited about on the web AR side is in starting to see main websites, so main.coms adopt augmented reality as a medium like they did video or GIFs. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, we're already starting to see some players embed web AR into their website, um, whether that be you know, model viewers like Quick Look or um, Eighth Wall Technology. And that gets me really excited. Like when I get out of bed right now, I'm not gonna lie, just like this, I this idea, this notion that everyday users are going to go to 
to main.coms, not for the purpose of augmented reality, but then stumble upon augmented reality as an, a content that they can engage with, I think that's mm -hmm. going to play a major role in overall user adoption. And so I think um, that's like one of, the, one of the things that gets me really excited about web AR. In addition to the fact that in 2020, we saw a great adoption of web AR um, and um, and especially at the at, from the eighth wall perspective, we saw so many eighth wall powered commercial projects, um, yeah. which were then utilized um, by the masses. And so, I definitely feel like 2020 was a pivotal point for Web AR, and 2021 will continue to see that growth. And I've always believed that in order for AR to be successful, we need to have native app AR, social AR, and uh, Web AR all in play. Um, and mm -hmm. in order to provide meaningful uh, instances and opportunities for the mainstream, when we're talking about the consumer space, to be able to engage with AR and find value from it. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about the web. Very, very excited. And of course the web, it's more accessible, you know, and people understand the web, they don't need to download an app. So there's, there's so much value in putting augmented reality in a browser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And then just to extend on that in particular, as we look at industries, I'm really excited about retail and fashion in that space. Um, we've done a couple different uh, or investments this year, one in Obsess, so they, they, and they, they do a lot of their work in AR and the other in all 3D. Um, and Obsess mm. focuses more on um, virtual stores, like um, they did several different Ralph Lauren stores and Tommy Hilfiger and um, some makeup related brands and fashion brands. And then all 3D focuses a, more on uh, housewares and uh, uh, home, home, uh, lifestyle photography and, and, and that space. But, but mm -hmm. both of those spaces, I think, are going to be really interesting in 2021, but start, started to get a lot of traction at the end of 2020. Right, yeah. And I, I think we've already talked about this between the two of us, but I'm so excited about that space. Um, and, you know, the pandemic obviously accelerated uh, retailers um, and marketers and advertisers to find new at-home strategies. And this right. included the creation of portals, which essentially are mini worlds. Mm -hmm. So ex mm -hmm. it's, it's exactly what you're talking about with Obsess and some of the other examples from like Balenciaga or Coach, these like right. these these almost like gaming worlds uh, for the most part that are 3D, but could possibly be um, and you have an augmented reality um, uh, engagement or a virtual reality companion, although not all of them do. These essentially are like branded portals or branded worlds that you could launch and then update and and have as living you know uh, living opportunities to engage consumers. And I think that this is really the beginning of the of the, of the metaverse is is actually the, from the bottom up being built. Where out of necessity, these new websites, these new applications are um, affording. Uh, people that are at home to have more of like a physical experience with the brand, which they're craving. Uh, but post pandemic, these will continue to live on. And if you were to connect all of those, you know, let you know, you have thousands of these, that's essentially, you know, being able to travel world to world in a metaverse. <laughs> at least I right, think so. Right. That, I mean, that or you, you'll you start to see it in gaming, right? You hear mm -hmm. the Roblox CEO came out today, I think, or and said something about, you know, the metaverse starting there or Fortnite or or Minecraft and you know, these places where you're seeing gaming starting to overlap with entertainment and music and um, and retail, right? And e-commerce, right? So you're seeing yeah. that 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 crossover between those industries and how they're just gonna start to merge together even more. And I think you and then you can add it, you know, education to that as well. Mm -hmm, and so I mm -hmm. think that's another trend in 2021 that'll be really interesting to watch is how do those different verticals start to blend together a bit more, right? Yeah, I love that. I think 2021, we're definitely starting to see convergence of a couple of, you know, emerging, mm -hmm. I'm gonna call I'm using air quotes, but you can't see with my alt space hand but emerging technologies and and you start to understand that it's not ar alone it's not vr alone but actually netwave is a combination of technologies ar vr ai blockchain mm -hmm. you know 3d gaming like uh that's what's Five really exciting D, yeah. they're coming they're coming together and we're like oh wow yeah when they work together 
this new wave makes sense. And, you know, just yesterday, um, I've been following the NFT space because in the, oh, yeah. um, in, in, in the art world, especially there's, there's so much activity happening with 3d art and I'm obsessed, like super obsessed with it. I I'm so excited that our, uh, 3d artists and 3d creators are able to make money with their 3d art. And it's, 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 it's looking like this is like a brand new art medium and this yeah. will, this will and is trickling down into gaming and gaming, um, items and digital assets, which in turn will be, um, how, uh, we'll, we'll show how it will play within our avatar, um, within, within our avatar space and how we may be, you know, e e buying things for our alt space avatar, whoever, av whatever mm -hmm. avatar system we're using. So even just like looking at that thread of blockchain and, um, and uh, identifying what's happening in the NFT space, although it may not be wholly active in augmented reality, if you don't have an eye on that, you're going to miss out how it's going to have a major role within our community and, and what we're trying to build on our side of the fence. So I love that. Totally I love agree. conversion 2021. <laughs> love it. Yeah, and AI too, right? AI and the and the concept of virtual beings is kind of a crossover. And, and um, you know, Lucy from Wolves in the Walls, you know, going from VR to then being an mm. AI on Instagram, and uh, you know, potentially personalization, leveraging AI, and then impacting your AR, or your VR interactions. I think all of that is 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 another convergence layer that I'm really interested in watching over 2021. Yeah, I agree. I think it was Matt Meisnitz who said that AR and VR is the GUI of AI, and I love right. that. And uh, I think I think we're definitely seeing even more clearly how AI is playing with AR in particular, especially if you look at companies like Snap, who you know mm -hmm. launched their Snap um, ML uh, offering within their platform, right. where outside external um, uh, machine learning libraries can now be used within the Snap ecosystem. You can do the same thing with Eighth Wall as well. And what that allows for is for folks that are focusing or startups perhaps that are focusing solely on being able to you know identify or track against feet which like that's like a that's a big effort like to be able to do that like wannabe or viking they can now train the, train their um uh train their algorithm and take that machine learning library and then make use of it within snap for example and because of that then the, the augmented reality feels more real that's really what we're seeing from an end user perspective is layering in that ai you know um starts to allow for augmented reality to feel more real either on the person or in the environment because the machine the computer essentially is able to make more sense of the world around it and that's like really really important you know what i mean yeah tom it's always such a pleasure to talk to you um and yeah and to to talk about what the the future could be do you, do you think maybe we should see if there's any questions in the audience yep. and that's and, that's a great uh, take, idea <laughs> take those um let's see i don't think yeah. if you uh if, i think oh there's somebody that can raise their hand let's see if i can oh allow hand raises i think we need to do there we go so i think Wait. i've uh, i've um I've allowed for hand raises, and I see uh, Yanni um, has now um, raised your hand, and so I think I'm going to give you the megaphone. And I'm sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Uh, Yanni, can you say something? Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, we can. Go ahead. Hey, hey Tom. Hey, guys. Great talk. Um, I had a quick question for Tom. Um, you briefly mentioned uh, Facebook, you know, had just recently come out, come out with Quest 2. And you briefly said three, four, five, six. I was wondering if you knew kind of for sure that Quest you know, 3 was going to come out and if you could predict when the Quest 3 would come out, you know, when would that be? Would that be a year in the future? Do you think they're going to do four, five, six, you know, in the subsequent years? Like, so, mm. that's it. so that's a good question. Did I say Oculus Quest 2, 3, 4, 5? Cause I, I hope I it didn't. Might I don't, have, I, it might have been my... I mentioned that, and I can explain yeah. what I meant there. Okay. <laughs> when, we, when we do our market sizing, we say, you know, Quest, and we want to future-proof that those predictions by saying any future variant that could come, and that could be three, four, five. Now, I think, personally, when we look at what Quest, what was launched with Quest 2, Facebook sort of future-proofed itself more so than most kind of consumer hardware products in terms of 
you know, shooting for, you know, all of the specs across the board, processing, resolu resolution, field of view, um, you know, even though it's not as great as some of the higher end kind of PC VR headsets, such as Valve Index um, or HP Reverb G2, for a standalone headset, it's, it's already to the point where, it, you know, it's not going to go obsolete anytime soon is, I guess, what I'm trying to say. So. I think that probably within the next 18 months, if we look at the kind of cycle of obsolescence and cycle of uh, products from Facebook, especially Oculus, um, I believe, and Tom, you may remember this better, more than me, the amount of time that Quest 1 was in the market before Quest 2 came out, it was just over a year, right? Maybe around 16 months. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, exactly. if, we, if we use that as historical perspective and precedent, we could say, you know, perhaps um, we'll see Quest 3. Now, I think the bigger question, not just the when, but the what, and what will Quest 3 be? Because I think with Quest 2, Oculus has really kind of stripped out a lot of the kind of non-necessary things just to get that price down. To get it down to 299 that was a major function. So it doesn't have, you know, the best strap, head strap in the world and, and other things like that. So what we could see is I think it's left itself some room to, you know, have that lower end, you know, sort of affordable device, but then, you know, a standalone that has, you know, more bells and whistles that's maybe in the, you know, 599, 699 range. So Quest 3 may be a replacement, a replacement for Quest 2, exactly where it sits in that sort of range, or it could, you know, have a Quest two quest two plus um you know it's it's really it, it's so uh -huh. early and i don't mean to kind of give a total cop out in that but those are a few possibilities that i see but mm -hmm. i think that you know 16 to 18 months could be a time frame in which we see some sort of quest three or you know who knows what the naming convention is going to be but those are just mm -hmm. a few guesses yeah. yeah i hear you mike i would just add like something that i've talked about for a long time is in order to get uh, mass usage, I, I think about three items for virtual reality headsets, and that's cost, comfort, and content. Uh, you know, that would go to smart glasses too, for that matter. But, you know, I think it's, you need to kind of nail all three of those in order to um, actually, you know, make it easy for more people to use it and, and to buy it. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think the only thing I would add to is uh, just trying to think of the, the user benefit of the next device and kind of who that target audience is. And I think that speaks to both what Mike and Amy were talking about. Definitely, um, although Oculus 2 is a magical device, uh, especially if you've been watching and adopting uh, uh, virtual reality HMD since the DK1. Um, but there, 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 there definitely needs to be um, an improvement around, you know, battery, battery life or charging and uh, comfort in order for longer term um, usability. Um, and so even, you, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if those would be some of the areas that um, Facebook um, focuses on. In addition, you know, right now the Oculus Quest Two is uh, it is you know the mo one of the most popular devices, but um, we also need to factor in what the possible um, device update will be from Sony, and that will influence you know perhaps what what Facebook may may come out with, as well as other major players that may launch an augmented reality device, or as Mike pointed out, you know an augmented reality virtual reality device, which I personally am really excited about. Um, and so like, it, it's both, you know, the user need um, as well as the competitive landscape. And then also just like what where Facebook wants to take this device um, and feels like uh, the consumer needs um, in order to help with this adoption. Let's see if anybody else has other questions here. Um, you can raise your hand if you have other questions. I don't see anybody here raising their hand quite yet. Oh, Leslie, please. Um, Please ask your question, yeah. Leslie. Yeah, um, one of the things that I've got my eye on, hi, is um, a great talk. Um, the digital mapping, the 3D mapping of the world that needs to happen in order for integrated um, content uh, to work in augmented reality, there have to be these, these digital maps. And when I look at the big companies that are doing that mapping of the world, because that's a huge task. You know, we've mm -hmm. got Google, we've got Niantic, and unfortunately, you know, just the bulk, the weight of that work seems to me that that means we're going to end up with these walled gardens 
just because of the investment that each company has put in to do that mapping. They're not going to want to play with each other. So whatever it is that I can do in AR on Apple is not going to integrate with whatever I can do on Google, with whatever I can do on Facebook, with whatever I can do through Niantic. And that seems to me to be like the biggest hurdle for yeah. actually having kind of an augmented reality world that's a true metaverse, where it's it's one thing. I, I really see us going down like a path towards multiple walled gardens, and that really concerns me. So do you guys have any, any thoughts on that? I do. Amy, do you want to uh, start, or should I jump in? I'll jump in. So. Um, uh, I will say, uh, Leslie, that I, I, I could see a, a path that you're creating in terms of the walled garden. Um, and I, I can't help but think of the smart home. So like the smart home right now is like you either exactly. have like a Google home or an Apple home. <laughs> and so um, I see why you're you're concerned about this. And um, right. we definitely we definitely don't want to get into a point where if I'm using, let's say, you know, a one one manufacturer's pair of glasses, I see one reality and you have no way to be able to see that reality. So there, there will need to be that reconciliation. I think I think this is a really important point to, to drive home is that like uh, essentially augmented reality in particular is like a percept, it's, it's perceptual computing and it changes the, our perception or how we perceive the world. And so, you know, we're in order to be on the same page to, to talk about the elephant in the room, no pun intended, we all need to be able to see that elephant at the same time, <laughs> unless mm -hmm. it, otherwise it won't make any sense. And so that's where the need for, um, that's where the need for cross-platform um, uh, solutions are, are dire. And so um, I, I hope that, and we've seen some alliances be created. I know that um, Niantic actually launched an, an alliance, a 5G alliance that's tried to bring people together. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps, perhaps that's that that's the best path forward. You know, uh, standard bodies are are, are on the rise, um, alliances are being formed, um, and um, and uh, you know, and maybe that is also an opportunity for a startup or you know some a, th a third party player to help with the the bridge if the walled gardens are are necessary. So um, it'll be interesting to watch the space, the mapping space in general. But I think you're wise to bring that point up. So I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's the XR Association as well that's looking to bridge across major technology um, XR companies. So keep an eye on that. Um, they just had an announcement recently. Uh, the other thing that I think is interesting is that concept of avatars crossing different spaces mm -hmm. and different applications. And there's some companies working on that too. So um, yeah, certainly it would be more efficient if we could do that. I think it'll be some combination of siloed and then convergence and siloed and convergence until we get to a more established um, and less emerging technology. And that's actually that's point, kind of, oh sure for sure. Because uh, I just love this question. I spend a lot of time thinking of this, and, and Amy, what you just said is what I want to rip on in terms of a hybrid type of situation, because I always look to the web. If we look at the web today, yeah. it is a combination. It is sort of a hybrid because we do have walled gardens, but I think the key point and something we need to aim for in this kind of AR cloud world is some unifying level, layer, excuse me, whether that be like a browser, like we have on the web. We have walled gardens, but we have common languages. We have common protocols like HTTPS. Mm -hmm. We have common HTML. We we have a browser that can kind of kind of go across the board so it, it there'll be some combination of walled garden fragmentation and then also unification and it's just it's going to be interesting to see how that works but i would look to the browser as really like the model we need the browser mm -hmm. of the spatial web i love that mike and actually that was the point i was going to add is like when i when i was uh, considering what my next step would be after super ventures and awe i was really thinking about leslie's point and also uh, what we're all talking about you know if i was to walk around the world with a pair of glasses and then essentially have this world um, be augmented um, you know, how would that be possible um, i'm not going to want to download an app every store or at every opportunity um, and um, and i want that to be shared, uh, it be frictionless, be accessible. And when I listed all these ingredients, I said exactly what you said, Mike, it must be the web. <laughs> oh my gosh, I just listed the web. And so that's where I was like, I got to head into web and web AR and make that my my a, a major part of what I'm working on. Um, so I find that really exciting. And we're definitely in the beginning stages. And back to Amy's point, I think we need to wrap up soon. But like Amy brought up infrastructure. Amy, I love that because I, I love kind of two things you said, infrastructure, not so 
so sexy. Yes, I guess I guess that's right. But also infrastructure, the fact that this is like on our list of things to start to tackle is a good sign of the maturity of the space. Um, and and I, I think this will be like the growing part of the conversation. And it, we need to be able to get the infrastructure uh, pieces in place in order for scale, right? Outside mm -hmm. of the XR community, how do we scale this to the world? That is gonna be the infrastructure. Any last um, words before we wrap up? No, I think that's a good summary. I, I, other than, you know, I would say this is still a growing space and the the pandemic that we were in, we are we are still in in 2021 has done nothing but um, encourage growth in, in a virtual space. So I, I think it's even more exciting and uh, the, the 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 next few years uh, to see how it is going to take us from the 2D flat screen Zoom space uh, to expanding mm -hmm. into a th more three dimensional world, more more digital layer on top of reality. Awesome. Well, Amy, thanks for joining me on stage and for joining us Such here. Such a pleasure. And mm -hmm. uh, Mike and, and Patrick Wen and Young, thanks for having us. And thanks everybody for listening. Um, I guess I'll hand it over to Patrick um to kind of round it out all right uh well yeah thanks everybody thanks tom thanks mike um thanks amy and also i, I forgot to mention in the beginning but big thanks to when he spent so much time putting this space together um, we even got rainbows outside, and um, so it's really appreciated when. So big round of applause for all the speakers. Um, take some selfies, post them on uh, Twitter, on LinkedIn, on all the social networks, and um, hashtag AWE Night SF. And um, last thing I want to just to quickly plug, uh, we'll be teaching a course, myself and our consulting manager, around learning how to deploy successful web AR uh, strategies um, for, with AWE Academy, which is a new AWE, um, I guess you could call it service platform. And we also got Tom and Mike that will be guest speaking at it. So go check it out, sign up for the course and um, let's mingle. Look forward to, to seeing you all next month. And thanks again so much for coming out.